Hi, I'm Jimmy. And I'm Alex. And for our project, uh, we designed a genetic algorithm to teach neural networks how to play blackjack. So in this presentation, we're going to talk about um, initially why we wanted to do this, and then we're going to go over how we did this, which includes the tools we used, um, an XOR exploratory problem, um, sort of the preliminary analysis for using the genetic algorithm and the different tuning parameters. Then we're going to actually get into how we played blackjack and our baseline measurements for that. Then we're going to go over the genetic algorithm, how it works, mutations, and pieces that fit there, talking about the results, and then we'll go over the challenges we faced in implementing this. After that, we're going to go ahead and talk about any future extensions we could do to the work or anyone else who could take our work further, and then how we allocated each piece and who did what. So uh, what really drove us to explore the neural network uh, problem was that there's some, some specific domains that are really hard to train using uh, standard stochastic gradient descent or other backpropagation based uh, neural network training algorithms. And so we said, you know, hey, maybe we can explore solving some of these probabilistic problems using something like a genetic algorithm. Uh, so someone who's done something similar to this and some fun applications of this is uh, like stock trading, uh, specifically the, in the Fuzzy Sets publication, a big paper there, uh, they did a paper called an Intelli uh, intelligent stock trading decision support system through integration of genetic algorithm based fuzzy neural network and artificial neural network. And basically what that means is that they uh, use some fuzzy mathematics to design a genetic algorithm to train neural networks uh, to play the stocks, which has real world financial implications, which are kind of a big deal for that sort of microtransaction, very fast, hard to solve things. Um, another place that, um, that we wanted to explore more was uh, artificial intelligence specifically for unsolved or unsolvable games. That means games that are based primarily on uh, probabilistic problems. And uh, some of the in, uh, approaches for this, we got reference from uh, the paper in 2003 that was published to IEEE Journal of Computing. Uh, was tuning of the structuring and parameters of a neural network using an improved genetic algorithm. And basically for what they did was they took a uh, set of neural networks and performed a genetic algorithm on them and were able to improve upon the base of the mutation sets that they used using sort of domain knowledge about the game. And we'll get into that a little bit more later. All right. For the implementation, we decided to use a language C++ because it's uh, compiled and fast and it's scalable and it works with the uh, uh, supercomputing cluster that we wanted to run our generations on. And for the neural network implementation, we evaluated a number. Uh, we evaluated CAFE and TensorFlow um, and then eventually ended up on FAN, which is a smaller, less known one, but it had the API that we wanted and it claimed to be very, very fast. Um, and for the, the heavy lifting of the computing, we used a compute cluster uh, that had 320 uh, CPU cores in it. And the way that we structured it was we had 319 of those cores acting as players and one of them acting as the head node that did all the coordination in the file I.O. And in order to coordinate between the different cores, we used OpenMPI to pass uh, memory and scores and such back and forth and to keep everything synchronized. And before we dived into the uh, complex problem of playing blackjack, we wanted to verify that that the approach would work. And we chose to do a, a very simple XOR problem with the genetic algorithm first uh, because it's, it's well understood. It's, it's a very standard example of a neural network implementation. It, it uses a very small network um, and it would give us a, a good proof of concept to make sure that we were in fact training correctly and that our, our code worked. And even with a problem as simple as the XOR, we discovered the, the first issue is tuning the, the mutation factor. Uh, we discovered that if you if you have a mistuned XOR network, specifically if, if your mutation rate is too high, uh, it would be tantamount to jumping around too much while trying to do stochastic gradient descent. And what happened was we fell into a local maxima if we evolved at all, and then it was very, very difficult to get out of that local maxima. So 
on this plot here, we start with 50% accurately. There's four different combinations of XOR inputs, obviously, so it was solving two of the four correctly. And then I made a very, very quick jump up to solving 75% accurately or three of the four networks, but then it would never be able to solve the fourth one because that would require getting worse before it got better, which the algorithm does not allow for. And after we figured out how to tune the genetic algorithm to evolve an XOR problem, uh, the plot looks like this. It, it evolves very quickly at first and then slowly approaches uh, perfection, basically an accuracy of one, and it eventually does get there. So this we took as success that our algorithm was training correctly and with some level of efficiency. So the blackjack game, in order to set an upper baseline, a goal for our network to attempt to achieve, we did some research and discovered that there are published strategies online and in, in, in books and such for what you should do, and these are, these are called action tables based on what your cards are and what the dealer's cards are. Um, and these claim to be the, the best possible chance of success that you have when playing blackjack, the least likely to lose money. You're still going to lose money, but it's just you're going to lose the least amount of money compared to if you did a different strategy. Uh, so we implemented one, and we ran 10,000 hands through it and got a 92% return rate, return rate through experimentation. Uh, theoretically, they claim to have a 99% maximum return rate. We didn't observe that, but that does not, that does not exclude the possibility that our implementation of this was flawed. Um, we implemented it as a lookup table, so it was very simple. And the return rate and the, and the chance of success are basically the how much money you walk away with versus how likely you are to win each individual hand. So actually integrating the neural network into our blackjack engine, um, Basically, the neural network we designed to have four inputs. We played around with um, actually giving it like the actual hand and just setting to zero the inputs that it doesn't have, sort of like a binary um, encoding scheme for that. But we eventually settled on having the input dealer card map to a 0 0.2 incremental value starting from minus 0.8, which we can see in the function get card input value uh, given to the right. Then uh, the player hand was the next input value, uh, which again was just the cumulative sum of the values of the cards. Then the uh, we had a, a binary value which was hard or soft hand which mapped to minus one or, or plus one respectively. And then if a hand can be split, uh, basically same binary scheme of encoding. Then in the hidden layers, we had two hidden layers. The first was an 80 neuron um, hidden layer. And the idea here is that having a high degree of neurons to train on will give us enough flexibility um, that so to sort of um, hopefully minimize any of the risk of falling into local maxima holes the way we did with the XOR. And then in the second layer, we have 20 neurons to sort of map things a little bit smaller incrementally and not lose as much information in the transitions there. And then we have a uh, two outputs, which again is whether or not we're going to split, which is a binary value, and then a more continuous uh, Va output value, which is a double, a hit, or a stand action. And this is sort of decided with the uh, three threshold sh code shown to the right. So the genetic algorithm itself is fairly simple. It's somewhat like a nearest neighbor search in the sense that it sort of just iterates over until it finds a maxima or until it hits some other threshold that we've decided. And there's sort of two ideas we've played around with, eventually settling on using a number of iterations uh, rather than a success threshold. And the, the idea here is that we don't necessarily know how good we can get this thing to train. We do have a theoretical upper bound, but you know, maybe things get lucky and the network figures out how to learn our specific random generators or something like that. So we decided to settle on a number of iterations rather than a success threshold for this. Um, generally, the algorithm goes where you initialize the weights and the biases of the neural nets uh, to a set of uniform random variables. Then for the number of iterations, you calculate the win rate, success rate, or return rate of the game on each child. And then you mutate the children using a mutation routine, which we'll get into next. And this is kind of the heart or the core of the, the genetic algorithm is this mutation function. So the mutation function itself, um, it sort of replaced the standard gradient descent or other traditional training methods with a randomized gradient, meaning um, instead of at each given point taking the 
theoretical best direction. It takes more of a random direction. And because of this, we decided to use a uniform distribution for the randomized uh, vector gradient, um, mainly to try to search the, the space as evenly as possible and try not to fall into any local maximas. Uh, there's also another factor, which is the um, mutation factor, which is uh, it's a proportional, in a sense, to the win rate of the player network. And the idea is that it'll shrink over time to make that gradient shrink as it gets closer to a maxima. So we explored two main different mutation methods, and these are the methods that basically add that random gradient to the, the specific weights we have. And we, we, we explored a singular mutation method, which is similar to when a single-celled organism splits um, and we just add a little bit of noise to that to sort of, uh, that, that noise term is the, the random gradient. And then there's pair bonding, which we explored, where we take two highly um, accurate or, or well-performing parents and wait, use a weighted average of them and then add some noise to that. And then each, each child has played over 150,000 hands or samples uh, per each mutation to get a fairly accurate win rate, which um, since this, you know, effectively binary win or lose, that gives us about a 1% two sigma confidence interval for that level of um, iteration permutation. So here's the different mutation functions. The singular mutation is very simple. The monetizer value is an exponentially decaying uh, function of the win rate times the mutation rate. And I believe we held the mutation rate uh, at, a, at a specific value throughout the all, all mutations rather than decaying over time. Um, and then basically we iterate over each weight and then add a random uniform vector to it. So very simple. And that uniform random, again, is it's the akin to the standard, uh, standard gradient that would be in something like standard gradient descent. Then we have pair mutation, which uh, takes two networks and two win rates and a mutation rate and calculates the factors. Um, here we use a factor of a to the n cubed over a to the n cubed plus b to the n cubed, where a and a, uh, a and b are the win rates respectively. Um, the thought here is using a cubic function over like a linear or a quadratic function. Um, it, it gives you a much higher ratio between uh, more performant networks. So take the the case of a 80% win rate for factor uh, for the for the first net and a 60% win rate for the second. That will give you a 70/30 split between the base child it generates. Um, then the modifier value here again is just an the same exponential decay rate, except using the guess of where the child performance should be based on its parents' win rates. Um, then again, the the weights are just the child's theoretical weights plus the random uniform vector using the child's guesstimated uh, gradient. So overall, uh, success was definitely achieved. Um, the 92% re return rate that we saw empirically over 10,000 hands was eventually um, beaten in a sense by both the singular and the pair bonding. Um, however, this is not to downplay the fact that that, that ideal empirical does not necessarily match the Empir uh, the, the theoretical maximum that that strategy could reach. It also shows that probabilistic or difficult training problems are trainingable, which is kind of like the, the main thesis of the, of the project. So here's the, 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 the actual success or return rate of the very best neural network using the singular mutation. And it starts at actually worse than 50-50, pretty much just guessing. Um, and then it sort of jumps up, and then we get a huge jump, uh, basically, where it goes from kind of wandering around to going to an actual local local maxima and that's at about 15 mutations so it's quite a quite a number of hands have been played at this point um, from there it sits around 80 80 percent or so and then we get a second jump where it shoots up to the 92 ish range and at this point we can actually look in at the action tables that are effectively generated by the neural network and it pretty much is the same as the ideal strategy the pair bonding is very similar, um, where we get around the 15 to 20 range, we get a large jump from the lower to the higher, and that's where it starts to achieve near the 92% empirical um, range that we saw. And then we actually get a little bit of a step up past that, which could be the network actually somehow learning the, the random function in which we've given the generations, um, and it gets a maximum of 96% uh, return rate. Um, so do you want to talk about this? The challenges that we faced implementing this were uh, a the the cluster <clears throat> coordination was difficult. We avoiding bottlenecks with the uh, with the backplane that the cluster operated on, and just logging the data. We we initially started out with the idea of logging uh, almost on a hand by hand basis, and realized quickly that that was going to be way too much data, and ended up only logging the the best success rate of each network at each generation because that was really all we needed to determine whether it was working or not. Um, and then we had to decide how we wanted to map the inputs. 
uh, we wanted to map them in order to give the network the best chance of success, uh, but we, we changed the way that we were mapping the inputs several times. We were initially feeding each network the list of individual cards and decided just to feed the network the sum total and then the features of the hand, such as whether it was splittable or not. And uh, that didn't change the results all that much, but it made the outputs uh, more analyzable in terms of printing out the action tables. Um, and then also, we already talked about it, but uh, zoning in on the tuning factors to make sure that we weren't, uh, we were going to mutate, but we weren't going to mutate slowly and that we weren't going to be susceptible to local maxima. So how we'd move forward from here, um, there's kind of a lot of different pieces, but examining the underlying assumptions that sort of base our genetic algorithm. Um, for instance, the choice of random uh, could have a, a big effect, or we could at least explore the effect of that, how using a Gaussian or poison distribution would affect versus the, the uniform, the ability for it to trans traverse the, the solution domain. Also, how the problem domain itself in influences the genetic algorithm effectiveness. Uh, would it be more effective for a more random process uh, versus like a more standard algorithm, or would it have a harder time learning in that situation? Um, also, could we solve uh, problems with uh, no known algorithmic solutions? Whereas, you know, with with the blackjack, there's at least the the lookup table sort of maximizing your probability of victory. Is there any any problem domains that could sort of be tackled or at least approached with this rather than um, blackjack or something similar to that. Also, how can we uh, use domain knowledge to improve the mutation methods? We didn't really explore in this, but it'd be a great way to expand upon. Um, a, just tuning the parameters better, maybe having a few more degrees of freedom we could explore, as well as improving the random gradient with a heuristic or estimation of the actual performance plus some noise factor uh, could, could greatly in improve or decrease the performance of the network. Um, we could also explore different mutation methods using more than two parents to create children, um, using coefficients used for random modifier calculation, basically taking that modifier value that was the um, basically the, the win rate that we used to determine uh, how random it should be, the plus or minus the shrinkage factor with respect to how close it is to a maxima, and modifying that in some other functional way. Um, and then also just exploring how the decay rate affects the the, the, the ability for the network to sort of hone in on actual solutions. And again, um, just exploring longer trials and more mutation to overcome any of the sy systematic and noise inherent in our random sampling method. I mean, we had 319 networks, under 50,000 hands per generation in 1,000 total generation. That's around 47.8 billion total hands we played, and that's just in the pair bonding plot, meaning we explored quite a bit more hands just in that. So increasing this number would likely correlate to a higher net performance uh, just over time due to the, the decrease in signal-to-noise ratio effectively in our, in our learning algorithm. So there was a, a lot of collaboration. We started out with three members, and then one of our uh, members had, unfortunately had to drop the class, so it was just Jimmy and I. And uh, we broke the work down as follows. Uh, I implemented the, the message passing interface and, and got our code to actually run on the cluster and, uh, and primarily handled uh, things like analyzing the ideal blackjack strategy. I focus more heavily on integrating the neural network library and exploring our options there, as well as developing the base for the, the network player and um, researching and developing the genetic algorithm mutation pieces. And then uh, I, did, I handled a lot of the documentation, documentation as well. And I say we, we both contributed quite a bit to the research. Well, thank you for your time.